Hi everyone, welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is the Franklin Ace 1000 video series. This is part two, and if you haven't seen part one already, you should watch that first, as this is a continuation of that first part. In this video, we're gonna dig into what's wrong with my Franklin Ace 1000 and try to repair it. So let's get right to it. What you see here is my once mouse infested Franklin Ace 1000. When I found it, it had a lot of mouse droppings and urine all over the motherboard. So that caused corrosion and has caused the machine to be relatively unreliable. I took off the top of the machine, which includes the keyboard and the lid, so I could better work on the motherboard and show it off. Now you may be noticing that the motherboard actually looks really clean and I did thoroughly clean it. I took it out of this computer and I actually washed it and scrubbed it to get all that mouse uh, like so we call debris off of it. It looks really nice and clean now, but there is a lot of corrosion on some of the chips and I really feel that that's causing the issues with this thing. On this part of the aluminum plate, there was I think a mouse nest right here and there was a lot of corrosion. I really scrubbed it and sanded it and tried to smooth it out a little bit. You can still see evidence of this uh, corrosion from the mouse droppings all over the base plate. All right, if we take a look at these chips right here, this is uh, evidence of the corrosion. Notice the pins on this are kind of black and gross, although this one is not too bad. I think I actually spent some time cleaning this one up. Some of these chips are just a lot worse. Like you may notice this leg on this IC right here is just sort of black and crusty looking. Let's look at the other side. And then that one right there as well. So it could well be that just one of these ICs has bad contact in the socket and that's what's causing issues. Of course, I've put deoxid on everything here, but you know, when it's all crusty and black like that, that's gonna prevent things from working correctly. I haven't actually showed you the problem of this machine. So when you turn it on, it seems to boot up normal, but if I put in a floppy disk, so this is Fat City, which we know works, and because um, we use it on the other one, we put it in. Oh, okay, it didn't even do anything. Let's. Power cycle this again. So see, it starts to load and then it freezes and that's it. I can hit reset and it does reboot, but this game never gets past this part right here. I'm gonna put in a copy of Locksmith version six, which is kind of a disc copy utility. This one actually loads more. So we get the screen here, but I don't have a keyboard plugged in, so I can't actually see if it's working. But I don't think it is because the disk drive light is still on and it never shuts off. But most of the time, the symptom of what you have, and if I put in Apple Cillin, which is a diagnostic suite for the older Apple II Pluses, you turn this on, it just kind of does nothing. After it does the initial seek, you don't even hear it trying to load and it will just sit here forever at this frozen state. I can reset out and you know get to basic, but of course I can't type without a keyboard, that works. But that's it, this machine just doesn't seem to fully work. Now, one thing that really hinders me in testing here is not having a working keyboard. If I did have a working keyboard, because it goes into basic, I would imagine I could do call minus 151 and get into the assembly language monitor. And I should be able to at least check out memory, make sure all the memory is able to be written to and read from, and poke around with basic commands to see what crashes and what's working. And that might help us figure out what exactly is the problem with this computer. One particular issue is I can't find schematics for the Franklin Ace 1000. If you look online, like on Asimov, you will find schematics for a Franklin Ace 1000, but it seems to be for a later version that has a completely redesigned motherboard. If you notice, this machine has 32 RAM chips to make up the 16K, and it could well be that just one of these RAM chips is faulty. The later Franklin Ace 1000 motherboard and the one the schematics you can find on the internet are, is for has only eight RAM chips for the entire 64K. When you compare this to an Apple II Plus motherboard, it's very, very similar. The only real difference is this row of RAM chips is missing on the Apple II Plus. All of the rest of the board looks very similar. Of course, it has built-in color and this has this board down here, so that's a difference. But but they definitely really cloned the Apple II and the Apple II Plus motherboard when they made this computer. I went ahead and removed the color board. It's sitting up there on the motherboard. So underneath, there's some interesting stuff. So the board plugs into this socket here, which says EEPROM 2516. 
And on this board here, it's a 2532 chip, so double the size. This is definitely the character generator ROM. So I suppose the early motherboard design only had support for uppercase characters and not uppercase and lowercase. Not exactly sure on that. In addition, you'll see there are several 74LS chips that are unpopulated. This one right here had this little PCB installed into it. So that shorts out a couple of the signals. This is the connection for the keyboard itself. And then that one there had this little uh, adapter socket thing that plugged in that went to this board here. But these chips here are left unpopulated. Taking a closer look at this board, it's gonna be hard to see on camera, but right here it says Franklin Computer Video Phase Modulator. So the way that the Apple II generates color is by altering the phase of the pixels. And that creates the various colors you see that are using NTSC artifact color. And it's all these circuits here that are creating that phase shift on the video output that gives the different colors. There's a 14 megahertz crystal right here off to the edge of the camera. This is probably divided to generate the color burst frequency on the NTSC, it's around 3.4 something or other megahertz. But I was curious what this computer would do without this board plugged in if I populated these ICs. Over here, the wire that feeds the video signal into the video output circuit is actually replacing a transistor. So there's probably a couple components that are missing that connect this video output circuit here to what's down on the motherboard below down there where that color board is. I think I would have to repopulate these components here, put a transistor in instead of this wire, and then of course repopulate these components down here. It's not worth doing all that work. Oh, I noticed that down here, there's a couple chips that are also missing. And yeah, those are just not installed on this board. They're left empty. I did just confirm on the other Franklin Ace, the one that works, that these ICs are missing on that one as well. So that's just the way this thing comes when this color board is installed. So the color board is back in and I wanted to try something. I removed this bank of 16K of memory. This is the lowest bank of RAM, 0000 through 3FFF. This is necessary for the computer to work at all. It just will not run. But I took this bank out just to see if the behavior of the crashing software is any different with that bank removed. And I have Fat City installed. Let's turn this on. Computer turns on. And it crashes at exactly the same point. It loads some of the game and then just immediately aborts. And I'm wondering if maybe this bank has a weird issue. I'm just gonna quickly pop a different 16K of RAM into this bank and see if that changes anything. These are chips that T Maloney sent me in a mail call a while back. All of these are 4116 RAM chips that will work in this machine. All of this is NEC brand. There's even some Apple branded chips mixed in here, but I'm just gonna install these NEC ones in here. And see if that works. All right, let's give this a try with this uh, different RAM installed. Same exact problem. <laughs> that was definitely not it. Now let's pop out a little, let's pop out a RAM chip in this upper bank, see if this one changes anything. So that bank, it won't even boot at all with that one taken out. And I've taken a chip out of the very top bank here, which is the uh, 48 to 64K. Probably not gonna have any effect to be honest. Oh. That prevents it from booting even differently. Let's try that one more time. Okay, that's consistently crashing as well. So it's interesting that this bank here is the only one that seems to have no effect on the way it's crashing and the other two do. And this bottom bank, I don't have to show you if you take one chip out of that, computer doesn't boot at all. It just shows garbage when you first turn it on. I'm gonna go look at the Apple II Plus schematics, try to figure out how this bank here is decoded. Maybe I can find the equivalent 74LS logic chip on this machine for that bank of RAM. 
So looking at the Apple II Plus and Apple II schematics, this is the same board really, uh, it looks like all the CAS lines and the address enable lines from the RAM goes back to a chip that seems to be at location F2. Well, these markings here are the grid markings, and those there's an F and an F dash. Well, this F here is this top row of RAM, which is that extra 16K that this machine has that the regular Apple II Plus doesn't. So I'm assuming that this F row is the row that is the same as on the Apple II Plus, because this one, this one doesn't exist. So looking at F2, I, this is a blank chip here, this little select lines. Uh, I think this is the chip here, this LS175. And let's pop this out. And would you look at that? It has a bent pin there that wasn't seated into the socket all the way, into this socket. I must have taken this chip out for cleaning and when I reinserted it, I wasn't careful. Let me straighten that pin back out and reinsert this chip. Actually, before I reinstall this, let's turn the computer on, see if this even boots up at all without that chip and see uh, what the symptoms look like without it installed. Okay, it's booting and it's crashing in exactly the same way. Right, the chip is back in, here we go, what's gonna happen? Oh, it still <laughs> crashed, no. So from a diagnostics perspective, I think at this point, what I need to start doing is literally just taking out each of these chips, checking for legs that look corroded and, and blackened like these two here, cleaning those off with a Dremel or sandpaper and putting them back in. Either that or I'll just go into my parts stash, see if I can find a, an equivalent chip, stick that in there and see if that improves the performance of this machine at all. I just pulled out another IC and found another bent pin. So clearly I did an absolutely terrible job inserting these chips into this motherboard. Uh, this one was up here. It's a 74LS20. Not sure if it's related to RAM, but it might be. No change. <laughs> that wasn't it. It's amazing how many things can work even with pen pins that aren't in sockets on this machine. Okay, I've done enough fiddling around on the computer. I found two chips with bent pins, but otherwise I'm not getting anywhere. So I think it's time to try to work on the keyboard. This is the backside of the keyboard as a Keytronic keyboard. And I've taken out the, all the screws on here, just like any other back PCB, like on a Commodore or something. And if we lift this off, there are the foam and foil pads. The silver pad may contact with the appropriate space on the keyboard and the microcontroller here registers a key press. That's how these work. So the foam that's underneath there degrades over time. So these silver pads aren't making good contact with this anymore. And that's why this stops working. I've never worked on one of these before. And I think the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use some 99% um, IPA on a cloth here. And I'm just going to wipe this clean. because There's kind of some crud on this board. So I went ahead and ordered a replacement set of the foam pads from Tech Select. I actually ordered these pads for a compact portable, but uh, it's all the same. I'm gonna use them in this thing and I will probably need to order at least two more sets of these because there's the compact portable I need to fix still. And then there's the other Franklin Ace that also needs new pads. And I guess I gotta try to figure out how to get these old ones out of here. Ugh. Okay, so there's one of the foam pads, it's all degraded, <laughs> along with the little silver contact there, but what's in the bottom of this here? How does this come out? I see how this works. Well, okay. There's a little plastic disc here that the foam was adhered to, and I gotta get that out of each one of these little key, um, <laughs> I don't know what you're gonna call them, off the, the little sliders. Okay, so let's take a look at these replacement foam disc things. All right, yeah, so it's a piece of foam. There's the plastic disc, and then there's the silver pad on the top. So we need to, so I gotta figure out a way to kind of get that down into there. So I just push the key up and I'm using my little O-ring pick here. And I go from the side and I just pop them out and they go flying.
That made a mess. <laughs> there, are, there are little foam discs all over the place, but they are all out of the keyboard. A couple of them were so fragile, they kind of disintegrated, but a lot of them were sort of corroded looking, which probably explains why it wouldn't type anymore. Anyways, I got to clean this up and, and then I can start reinstalling. Okay, so I really have no way to know how to install these, but you got to kind of get the, the little plastic disc under the little clips that are on there. Each slider has four little clips around the perimeter and you got to get the little uh, plastic side of these foam pads, so this clear side, to clip in. Now it seems like I have this one in there, but this one on the other hand, it's not quite in there. I think it is now. So here we go with the tedious process. I just kind of got to got to get this down onto here and push it down. Well, that was fiddly. I have them all in, I think. And uh, yeah, that's not easy to get them clipped around all four sides. I just ended up very carefully going around each one. I had to kind of go back and double check that I had done the right thing on a lot of these. So I hope this works. I remember watching one of 8-Bit Guy's video where he did this process, put it back together, and a bunch of keys still didn't work. So my fingers are crossed that I don't have that problem with this. Okay, I'm going to put this back together. Okay, we're ready to test. I don't have all of the screws on the back PCB, just in case I gotta take this thing apart again, but I think I have enough on for, you know, just testing purposes. It is plugged into the keyboard. I took it out of the top case, obviously. I need to turn the TV on, make sure that is working and ready to go. Okay, this is on the right way. Yep, pin one is this way. Video three, here we go. Okay, I reset this. Hello. Okay, so far so good there. Hello. All right, well, I'm just going to test all the keys, I guess. Well, I will be. All of the keys are working. There's lowercase g. Yep, everything works on this keyboard. This is actually the first time I've ever been able to type every character on this, and the only thing that's weird is five, sometimes types two, but you know what, it's not doing it now. It could also be because all the screws aren't in the back of this PCB that it's uh, a little touchy, but hey, awesome, it works. All right, now the keyboard is working. Let's power this thing up. I'm gonna press reset to go to basic, and we're gonna go into the uh, assembly language monitor thing. If we have 8,000, it's currently holding zero, and this is the working memory. So we're gonna try to write AA into that, and now when we look at it, we have AA stored there. And we're gonna go down to 4,000, which is the memory I don't think is working, and that, for some reason, has a four in it. So we're gonna go to 5,000, which has a four. Now, it's so weird. So let's just try and store AA in the 5,000 and we get AE. So it's sort of story memory in there, but it's almost like a bit's not working. What the heck is, let's try that at 6,000. 6,000, oh, it's a mirror copy as well. So that's definitely not selecting correctly. So we'll try store CC in there, and we get CC stored in there, but if we go to 5,000, we have CC there, and we have it in all, all these different places. The memory shouldn't be mirrored that way. All the RAM seems to be kind of looping over and over again, actually. So if we go down to 2000, this is in the first 16K, right? So 2000, let's change that to AA. 2000 is now AA, and what about 3000? AA as well, what? Writing to one memory location in the 6502 address space shouldn't write uh, a mirror copy all over the place. Okay, I'm gonna write that to 2000. So A, B, C, D, E, F, zero, 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 right? And then when we look at 3000 to 3008, we have the same contents. Well, I feel like there's a couple problems going on. Let's ignore that replicating of the memory right now. One thing is for sure is when I write all zeros into 4000, anywhere in the 4000 bank, I get back 004 on all the memory locations. And that feels like to me that there's a stuck bit. 
And I wonder if one of the RAM chips that I installed is actually faulty. That could quite well be. And that is causing this. Now there's two problems with this whole repeating memory over and over and over again. I think that's a separate issue, but this, this seems like bad RAM to me. We shouldn't be getting zero four after I write four into it. What's handy on this motherboard is they wrote least significant bit and most significant bit right here. And that would lead me to believe that this is data line zero and that is data line seven. So because we're getting four, no matter what we store, it would be this chip right here that would be potentially faulty or maybe there's a bad connection. And that would be because this was the least significant bit. So this is one, two, three, four, if we count in binary. So this is the chip I'm gonna suspect. I'm gonna pop this one out and swap a different one in and see if at least this problem goes away. Okay, new chip is installed. Let's go into the monitor. And then we're gonna take a look at 4,000 right now. Okay, so it's all Fs just like before. And I'm gonna write zero, zero into it uh, eight times. And look at that. Look at that, 4,000 to 4,008. And now we're getting all zeros. Okay, so that RAM chip was bad. So that's one problem, but clearly, we're probably still having the mirroring issue. So if we do 5,000 to 5,008, yep, there are all the zeros I wrote. In fact, just to show you that that is happening, we'll do A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, E, E, F, F. Uh, why don't we do one, two, like that. And now if we do 5,000 to 5,008, there it is. There's that same information written over and over again. Let's take a look at how often this repeats. So if we go 4,000 to 4, F, 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 Let's take a look. Oh, there's a pause key on this keyboard. That's very handy. Okay, so let's see how often this repeats. So, so far we're not seeing it. We just saw that one copy. Okay, so it seems to replicate. So if we go 5,000 to 5FFF, we'll see it once. At the top, it just scrolled by. And now we're getting all Fs. So the replication appears to be happening on the 4K boundary. So when you have 5,000 and you go to 5FFF, that is 4K of uh, address space. We'll just quickly check this to make sure that my logic is right. There it is again, 7,000 to 7,008. There it is again, 8,000 to 8,008. We shouldn't see it here. Yeah, this is different. This is a totally different bank of memory. So even though each of these eight chips is 16K, it seems like it's only addressing the first 4K and then everything after that in each bank is replicated four times. That probably explains why I say basic works because it's running within that first 4K of memory, but everything else I try to do boots up and takes up more than 4K of RAM and just immediately overwrites itself. Okay, I've been doing a little schematics viewing for the Apple II Plus schematics. It's definitely not exactly the same as this board, but I think it's sort of close enough. The problem I think we're having is that address line 13 gets to the RAM uh, address multiplexers because 4116 RAM is multiplexed and doesn't seem to be getting through to the RAM. Address line 13 would be the address line, I think, that controls which of the banks, you know, so 4K, 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 I think if address line 13 is stuck or not getting through, that would potentially cause this problem. Now the CPUs up here and the address lines uh, get buffered through these chips here, and then they make their way around the motherboard. And one of the places that it goes to is C1. And C1 is definitely a socket that doesn't look so great. It's kind of corroded. Now, according to schematics and what I confirmed with the multimeter is it makes its way down to pin four. Let's pop this chip out of here. And pin four definitely seems okay, I guess. Let's pop a different chip in here. I'm just gonna substitute the chip I had in there over here on this spot. These are also uh, 153s. Make sure the computer still works. Okay, it does. And I'm just gonna double check to make sure that it's still having the, oops, still having the, the mirrored memory problem. Yep, it's definitely still mirrored. I do wanna show one thing. So address line 13 from the CPU definitely works. And that's because the ROMs are decoded starting at D000. 
And notice here that D000 and E000 are different. They aren't having the replication that the DRAM is. I think it's F000 is also ROM space, oops, 007. So that's different as well. So all that replication is happening in the lower part of the RAM. And looking at the memory map here, we can tell what happens if we try to use high resolution graphics is it starts at 2000 and basically because it's all the memory is being mirrored, when the computer tries to erase um, all the space starting at 2000, it overwrites all this stuff that's down here, which is basically the processor stack and the zero page and everything. It essentially, it will completely crash the computer. And that can be borne out if we exit the basic here and I type HDR, which in turns on the graphics mode. It tries to initialize and now the computer is completely locked. In fact, if I hit the reset button, it will just reboot entirely. And you look at that. All right, so I've done a bunch of uh, attempted reverse engineering, focusing on address lines 12 and 13, since those are the two that would cause this looping memory problem. I spent a bunch of time deciphering the Apple II Plus schematics and it just it just doesn't match this. It just Some stuff does, but a lot of stuff doesn't. So I was using my multimeter to trace out where the signals were going, which is what's on this notepad here. And one of the things I found is that address line 13 goes over here to this chip here, location C1. This is a 74LS153, also known as a MUX. Now, what I noticed, and I think I showed this earlier, is that the socket was completely messed up on this one pin, pin number one there. And when you look up the pinout of the 153 MUX, incidentally, address line 13, went to, I think, uh, this pin or one of these two pins here. This MUX is split into two halves. It's a dual MUX. And pin one is the enable pin for half the MUX. And it happens to be the enable pin for the half that address line 13 was going to. So looking at the pin number one, it looked all messed up and bad. So I took the board out of the computer and I tested continuity from the back side of the motherboard on pin one to the, the IC that was plugged in. And there was none, there was no continuity. So I decided to desolder the old socket and I've installed a new one, as you can see right there. It's one of the round hole types that I happen to have. And while I was at it, I noticed that one of the pins on this socket was also messed up. So I decided to change that out as well. I actually didn't tone this out. And I don't think this particular IC has anything to do with the memory problem I'm having. I think these ICs are responsible for decoding the chip selects for the ROMs. Anyways, I decided to change that out anyways since I was desoldering sockets. And this one, the pin looked completely broken as well. So let's put these chips back in here and then we can give this a try. So this is the 153 that goes into this socket right here. And this is the 74138 that goes into that socket. Make sure that's plugged in correctly, it is. And I have the newly fixed keyboard connected. Let's see what happens. All right, let's turn this on. Okay, let's drop the basic. Okay, call minus 151. So let's go to 4000 and let's set some memory here. 01, oops. 01, 02, 03, 04, 05, 06, 07, 08, 09. Okay, so let's check it, check that out. 4,000 to 4,008. Close enough, 4,008, I put five. All right, so there it is, uh, one through nine. And let's do that again to 5,000. And if this works, we should not see one through nine. We should just see probably all Fs. Oh my god, it's all zeros, which is fine. I don't mind that at all. Okay, let's uh, let's just for fun check out the entire... Alright, so that was the 4,000 bank. It was all Fs, except for the little bit I changed at the top. And let's check out 5,000, all Fs. And it's all zeros. Now, I don't really know the state of this stuff when you first turn the computer on. But before, we were just seeing a replica of... Uh, all of 4,000 in 5,000 and of course in 6,000. Let's just check that. Oops, 6,000 to six, I'm just gonna do to 6,008. We're getting all Fs there. So it almost seems like it initializes as Fs and zeros and Fs. And then let's just check out 7,000 to 7,008. And it's all zeros and we're not seeing the mirroring. Okay, this is good, this is really good. So let's see, I think I have, okay, there's the Fat City disk. Let's uh, reset that. Okay, I'll just turn the computer off and on. 
Here we go. Hey, it's loading. <laughs> it works. I can't even believe it. Wow. I am over the moon. Just, just doing the little reverse engineering on this notepad here took a long time because I don't have the schematics and I'm just basically going backwards trying to decipher how the memory decoding works. All right, so what fixed that? I am positive it was uh, C1 here. It was this IC. That half of the MUX was not being enabled and that was resulting in the memory looping. I am pretty positive that this IC was probably okay. I don't think there was a problem over here, but this one definitely, definitely was causing that particular issue. And it was all from corrosion on the socket from that mouse piss that, that killed that pin. Okay, on this floppy, I have Apple Cillin 2, or, and there's also a copy of Master Diagnostics on the back. I'm pretty sure Apple Cillin, what this is, is a diagnostic tool for the Apple II series. I can run a RAM check with it. Let's see what this works. Oh, boots, that's a great sign. Okay, push one for RAM memory. Uh, motherboard, low address range, sure. Let's pick, pick A, and this utility will test the motherboard from 000 through 1FFF. I don't really think this thing can properly test the, the zero page, the stack space. In fact, it probably starts, well, it says it starts at zero. I'm dubious about this actually working. Okay, well, let's go back to RAM and we'll do high address space B. Let's see what address range this is. Okay, so 2000 through BFFF. So on the motherboard, that's part of the first bank and then the second and the third bank. So let's run S for start and I'll just let this run for a while. Okay, this has run a whole bunch of times and it has not come back with any errors, which is understandable. The computer seems to be working and I doubt it would work properly if there were really a problem. Let's go back here. Okay, so this does have a memory card. Uh, one slot selected, let's do D, slot number zero. I mean, it's a virtual memory card, right? Because it's built in the motherboard, but i sure it works the same way. Let's see what happens. Okay, yeah, it's doing it. Okay, so basically this part of memory is bank switched with the ROMs. You can kind of switch them in and out. You can copy the ROMs into the RAM. They can do stuff like that. And uh, yeah, no errors, excellent. And there we go, this has run through a bunch of times and it's definitely working. Hmm, your eyes are not deceiving you. And this is a low resolution color display showing color bars. And these colors are horrible. Orange, kind of a yellowy color. Brown, I guess is brown. Light blue is purple. Medium blue, gray is gray. And then dark green is kind of like a, a bluey green color, purple, and then magenta is very similar to purple. There's a whole lot of purple shades in here. This is pretty bad. This doesn't look anything like an actual Apple II. These are the 16 colors right here. You can ignore these three on the right side there. And where's the reds and where's the orange? I mean, everything just looks pretty craptastic. It's funny, these low res colors look so terrible because the high res colors, which is the orange and green, purple and the blue, white and black, those look really good. They look very good, like watching Fat City play. What's happening with these low res colors? This is just ugly. Okay, let's summarize. First, I wanna thank Chris for donating that working Franklin Ace 1000 and this floppy drive to me. Oh, and the hard drive, which I haven't tried out yet, but I don't have an interface card. So there's no way to, to try that out. If you happen to know how those CIDR hard drives work, please let me know in the comments section below. Next, I broke out my non-working Franklin Ace 1000 and I did a whole lot of fiddling around, swapping chips here and there, trying to figure out what was causing the RAM issue. But because I didn't have a working keyboard, I couldn't actually do some proper diagnostics. Once I did fix this keyboard, and that was interesting, uh, fiddling with those little foam pads, but hey, I'm glad I was able to do it. And now I know the process, I can go ahead and fix my other foam keyboards. Having a working keyboard finally enabled me to use machine language monitor like I had wanted to do from the very beginning to first identify a bad RAM chip, which was one of the RAM chips I installed, so it's very unlikely the original RAM was bad actually, but also allowed me to figure out that looping RAM problem, which brought me to address lines 12 and 13, which allowed me to trace on the motherboard to figure out which chips were on those address lines. Normally I would just look at schematics, but since those aren't available for this motherboard, I had to do it manually, which was very time consuming. And then it led me to that bad MUX chip, well, the socket. So that part of the MUX wasn't being enabled because there was no ground on the enable pin, and that was causing the problem all along. I did refer back to the working machine that Chris sent me several times 
when I was tracing out what on this motherboard just to make sure that I was seeing the same thing on that one. I didn't want to miss something due to a potentially corroded socket because I knew corrosion was probably what was causing the problem on this computer and not a faulty chip. Oh, I almost forgot. I showed how to change the reefas on the power supply and also remove that filter component. And while that one was working, this power supply in this non-working computer originally was tripping my breaker because of those filter caps were leaky. So anyways, if you have that problem, you need to remove those filter caps from the machine. So there we go. <laughs> this was quite a marathon. I hope you liked this video. And if you did, I would appreciate a thumbs up. But if you didn't, you know what to do. You can hit that thumbs down button, hit that subscribe button to subscribe to my channel. It really helps me out. And of course the bell icon next to the subscribe button will notify you when I upload new videos and put your comments and your suggestions in the comment section below. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.